Go ahead. All right. I move we conclude the executive session and re-enter general session. Second. Moved by Jerry and seconded by Colleen. Any discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Uh, four ayes, one abstain. Uh, just a quick uh, note for everybody in case you're waiting around so you don't have to wait around if you don't want to. Uh, uh, board met. Uh, I know people are wondering whether the board is going to appeal. Uh, we have scheduled another meeting uh, for January 2nd at 6 p.m. No decisions have been made yet. We hope to have a decision made at that time. All right, next up is consider approving select board meeting minutes of December 12th and 13th. First, let's do the 12th. Does anyone have any? Uh, All right, so you had the minutes the from the 13th. That was the all-day budget hearing. The, it's pretty simple minutes. Uh, does anybody have any uh, changes, Just proposed changes? Hearing none, someone like to make a motion to approve? So mm -hmm. moved. Moved by Colleen, seconded by Jerry? Correct. Uh, any discussion? Okay, Mr. Saar, would you like to discuss the meeting minutes of December 13th. Chris Boyd's very expert and interesting tour of the salt facility. Thank you, but we're now speaking about a motion to approve the minutes of December 13th, so the discussion is limited to that. Do you have anything on that, Mr. Sar? No, but do you Thank have you. a response to my question? Uh, it's, it's inappropriate at this time. Ah, uh, is there any yes, more discussion on uh, the approving the minutes of December 13th? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. I will abstain because I did not uh, stay till the end of the meeting. Next uh, item is uh, 10 minutes for public comments for items not on the agenda over which this board has jurisdiction. Can I see uh, some hands? How many people want to speak? One? Okay, Dr. Metz. Go ahead. Actually, I'm going to have Jerry sign this okay. since I wasn't here. Jerry, excuse me. These are the minutes from December 13th, and since I abstained, if you could please sign on behalf of the board. Thank you. All right, Dr. Metz, sorry. Thank you. Uh, I have two questions, please, sir. The first one is, uh, could, could you or a member of the board clarify the status of the hazardous material ordinance uh, since the, it's been permanently enjoined, I, I gather, from Judge Sessions' decision? And so I'm wondering what the status of that ordinance is. Is that going to come into uh, uh, use? Uh, uh, for everyone else except for the railroad, or is that permanently enjoined, period, uh, in general? So that was my first question. Okay, what's my, your second question? My second question is what, if any, uh, sodium chloride or salt uh, monitoring is taking place uh, around the town's sand and salt storage? Because we've heard a lot about the railroads monitoring, but I'm unaware that there's actually any monitoring program of the towns, and it seems reasonable that we should have some data on that. So those were my two questions, please, sir. Okay, thank you. First question, status of the ordinance. Judge Sessions' decision, uh, as it stands now, holds that the ordinance uh, is preempted as to the railroad, but only to the railroad. So it is applicable to everywhere else in town. Uh, in regard to your second question, uh, sodium chloride in, in the town's salt shed, I think, was your question? Yes, sir. Uh, about six weeks ago or something like that, eight weeks ago, two, three months ago, I can't remember for sure, uh, the town staff started to investigate uh, the salt shed, 
uh, to see if we can improve uh, what impact that shed has. Uh, but Joe can answer that more because that's a, something that staff is doing. So that monitoring, does that include the test, the test wells? That I, we're, I, I don't know, but, so, uh, but, but there's a huge difference between 550 tons and 80,000 tons. Well, I wasn't concerned about that. I was concerned about whether we're monitoring it in the same way that the railroad is monitoring. Well, I would, I, would, I would be surprised if that were the case, since yeah. this 550 tons versus 80,000, I'm unaware of any town salt shed in the entire state which is required to so, monitor in the same way. But, so Joe, yeah, but do I, we I, have I, any monitoring? I, any monitoring? Do you guys want me to answer this? Yeah, yes. go ahead. Okay. Please. Uh, I want, before I get a definitive answer for everyone, because I don't want to misspeak, I believe we do have... Oh, wow, someone else is... <laughs> Uh, I would like to check with both our wastewater superintendent and the highway superintendent before giving a definitive answer. I'll give the entire community one. Um, but we do have test wells in certain areas, and I just want to make sure that when I'm answering you the question that I'm giving you the proper information. So I will double check and provide you that answer. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, no one else had anything I saw? Oh, somebody changed their mind? Mr. Saar. As I was saying, I wondered, Mr. Chair, if you'd had a chance uh, to uh, read Chris Boyd's report on the salt facility. It really was an eye-opener, and everyone in this room should do the same tour. I certainly intend to. But it strikes me as amazing that you guys are continuing with this vendetta against Vermont Rail, and you've never even looked at the damn facility. Wake the hell up, please. Okay, anyone else have any other comments? Melissa Fletcher, hello. Hi. Um, I'm one of the neighbors, I live in one of the neighborhoods that is absolutely adversely affected almost daily by the absolute noise from the pneumatic hammers from Vermont Rail. And I've seen Chris. Boyd's data. I've seen the salt sheds from the La Platte, from me, every side, and I really don't think they're state of the art and they can't contain their noise, they can't contain their salt. I urge the board to appeal. Thank you. All right. Anyone else have any comments? Please, Adeline. Some My name is Adeline Simonon, and uh, I also live in Shelburne next to Melissa. Uh, I do urge you to appeal this decision. I think we actually stand a chance on appeal for various reasons. Uh, and I also want to share something that comes from a document called Juris Jurisdictional Opinion, Shelburne Salt Storage Transloading Facility. It's a document <clears throat> from this, the District Environmental Commission from August 29, 2016, where it's indicated Salt will is not the only commodity Wolfson wants at the freight yard, no, known in rail speak as intermodal facility. He hopes train will bring other cargo. We're looking at fuel oil, yes, he said. I'm not ready to have 80, 000, 80 rail tracks coming from Bennington and being stored in our town. This is hazmat. Salt is also a hazmat, even so it's not listed as, as hazardous material. I believe that, you know, when We've already noticed a uh, spill, and this goes into our water, and this goes into what, uh, the, the, this is the drinkable water for us. So the, I think it's, it's an issue for, for our select board member to address, and I do urge you to, to um, consider appeal. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, we've heard from a lot of people in regard to the appeal through, uh, I'll get to you, ma'am. No, all I want to uh, no, I'll get to you, ma'am. We'll uh, get to, uh, we've heard from a lot of people about the appeal, and please, if you want to contact us, uh, contact us uh, some more. We've, I'm, everybody might have their own view on what they're interested in. I'm interested in uh, hearing from people who have experience at the Second Circuit and in federal court to see what their opinions are in regard to an appeal. And I see you're laughing over there, Carol. What's so funny? Very few attorneys have the practice in the world. Oh, yeah? Well, there happen to be several right here that I do. That, but it, it is, it is 
Thank you. All right. Do you have something? Do you have something that you'd like to say, ma'am? I just wanted to know what she said. I couldn't hear her. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Gail? Can we, can we answer that? I also had difficulty understanding what that statement was. Well, would you like her to say it again? Yeah, but maybe in this direction. Adeline? Adeline, you've, you've spoken before. You're not, under no obligation to speak again. But if you'd like to speak again, some of the people uh, would like to I hear you. I don't know what, what you want to read exactly. We couldn't hear you. You weren't close enough to the mic. I was not. OK. So. If you could just come to the microphone and uh, just speak up a little. You don't have to say the whole thing. You can just summarize it. It's, it's available on TV if someone wants to hear you again. Right. So I'm just you know, asking. I would like our select board to consider the appeal, uh, appealing this decision. I don't think, you know, uh, this uh, decision, uh, judge, judge session indicated that, you know, um, the significant burden placed on the railway outweighed the town's inconclusive and overstated public health and safety concern. I think we have very valid and legitimate uh, public health concern. And I would like the town to consider uh, pursuing this uh, uh, you know, appealing this decision. Um, that's all I have to say for now. Thank you. All right, so we've had 10 minutes of comments. We'll have more comments uh, later. Now it's uh, time for uh, six. number six, consider approving financing for execution of a one-year capital improvement bridge loan from Union Bank in the amount of $1 million and an interest rate of 1.19% to fund initial expenditures associated with the library, town hall, municipal campus project, and an execution of a one-year loan with National Bank of Middlebury in the amount of $116,000 to finance the purchase of a sewer tanker truck. Joe, I want to turn it over to you and maybe uh, Peter. Uh, start with the uh, the bridge loan, and uh, the two principals of Neagley and Chase are here. Um, usually it's um, more of an administrative task with the board to approve these, but I can understand this is kind of a more important project and maybe a little bit larger of a loan than we typically do. So they are here to answer some questions. Um, but the um, this would be to, so typically the Vermont Municipal Bond Bank goes out for issuing of debt uh, once a year in August or July. This year just happens to be that they're going out for a, a winter issuance of debt. So they contacted me and Peter to see if we would be interested in putting the um, library bond project <coughs> as part of that. Um, I don't think it um, makes a lot of sense beca because between now and August, um, we're likely not going to use the vast majority of that amount. So it makes a lot more sense to uh, use the short-term flexible borrowing to get us through August um, and then roll into the long-term debt in August when after that is when the, the larger amounts of money will come due. So um, Mark and Andrew are here from Neagley and Chase in the event that the board has some questions, but they've provided, both Neagley and Chase and Vermont Integrated Architecture has provided us <coughs> with uh, the cash flow of the project and uh, this appears to be the prudent uh, financial move at this point. Thanks, uh, John. Mark, it's, hello, thanks for coming. Andrew, thanks for coming. Your wife writes great stories. <laughs> <laughs> uh, does anyone have any uh, questions on the board? Are they going to get this bond out before the tax bill? Do you think? Please, Peter Franco. It's actually a line of credit, um, and we have locked in the interest rate, so we will only draw it down as we need it and then pay interest on the amount that we borrow. And it will be maturing, as Joe said, probably this summer when we would roll it into a longer-term bond for the entire project. Peter, is this interest rate actually lower than the bond rate that we're going to get? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah. Yeah. And, Peter, how did we decide to go with Union Bank? Is that, can you speak to that? Um, I solicited bids from three different banks, and they were the lowest, uh, lowest bank, lowest interest rate. All right, any I'm going to please. make a quick suggestion, for, meaning no disrespect, but for those okay. of us who don't know who you are, oh. would you mind introducing yourselves? Because you'll be familiar in the community for some time now. And uh, Sure. Mark? 
This is Mark Negley, everyone from Negley and Tracy. Just take the mic, please. Congratulations. Thank you. So I'm going to talk to you. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I'm Mark Negley, and I'm the, I live here on Heritage Lane. I uh, did all the work at Shelburne Farms over the years, so I've been here for like 30 years, and we're really excited about doing this project, and we will deliver value. You can count on it. Mm -hmm. All right. And my partner over here is Andrew Martin. He's the uh, CEO of our company. And what is your company? Negley and Chase Construction Company. They're building the library. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right, so anyone have any uh, comments? If not, let's do these one at a time. Thanks, Peter. Joe? Someone uh, like to move to uh, approve the execution of the one-year capital improvement bridge loan with Union Bank in the amount of $1 million at an interest rate of 1.19% to fund initial expenditures associated with the library, town hall, municipal campus project? So moved by Colleen. Is there a second? Second. Second it by Jerry. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, it's unanimous. Get paid. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now we'll just say uh, work has commenced. We've done surveying today. The uh, geotechnical drillers were out behind, uh, so work is moving forward. That's really neat. Thank you. All right, Joe, why don't you give us a quick talk about the 116,000 for the sewer tanker truck? Okay, uh, Peter can fill in any gaps. Uh, Peter's. Um, I think uh, throughout the years has done a good job when we have um, larger equipment um, purchases like this instead of doing a five or ten year note what he does is just roll over one year notes at a time because the interest rates are much more favorable that way so that's been Peter's method of financing our larger um, equipment purchases which uh, has been a tremendous cost savings since Peter's um, been here for 20 years so It'd be hard to aggregate that amount, but he's done a magnificent job of um, looking for those savings uh, during the year. So this would continue that to do another one-year loan. This is in the sewer fund for the tanker truck, um, and 116000 at their interest rate of 1.93%. So people know what Peter Frankenberg does here. He's not only an incredible asset in regard to finance. When we have issues, and I'm bringing this up because we just did the library, when the library was leaking a year ago, Peter Frankenberg came in and went over to the library and helped clean up the water to protect the books that were there. That's the kind of man that Peter Frankenberg is. He does so much more than just uh, financial work. So. Here, here, he's, Peter. he's a special man. Uh, any uh, for discussion on the uh, sewer tanker truck? Anyone? Someone like to make a motion? Sure. Uh, so moved. Second. Okay. Uh, and let's just read it so Marianne can understand it. So I'm assuming your motion is to approve execution of a one-year loan with National Bank of Middlebury in the amount of $116,000 to finance the purchase of a sewer tanker truck, right? Correct. Correct. As okay. seconded. And seconded. All right. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Item seven, discuss social media policy. Joe, why don't you uh, take it over and just give everybody a little framework where this policy is coming from, what document it's part of. Okay. These were um, part of the uh, slew of documents that the select board received uh, a few weeks ago from uh, staff, the revised personnel policy, the drug and alcohol policy for your CMB drivers, and the social media policy. Um, I would like to say that the social media policy, I received some comments from Josh um, yesterday, I thought, or last night, I don't know. They were all um, reasonable comments uh, for sure. Not enough time to respond or, or consider them, but, you know, I glanced at them, Josh. I thought they were good comments. Um, you know, at this point, it's in the select board's hands, so I certainly, um, you know, it's, it's, it's your ball moving forward. I just would like to say that uh, we did, with all of these policies, they were reviewed by the Vermont League of Cities and Towns with an HR expert and with their municipal assistance program and... All these policies were also reviewed by um, the town attorney before coming here, as well as reviewed by uh, department heads and all staff. Me, Peter, Susan Canizero, and Ann Janda worked on them for two months after 
uh, all the um, input was received from the town attorney and from BLCT. So it's been pretty well vetted, not to say that the select board shouldn't feel comfortable making edits or suggestions or amendments, but I do want to be clear that it's been um, well reviewed by people who are familiar with municipal best practices with this, uh, with these sort of documents. So I think last meeting the select board decided it might be easier to look at these documents in chunks rather than all at once and it was agreed upon that uh, that tonight the board would look at the social media policy. So there it is. Great. Uh Josh, you uh, submitted something, uh, so, I don't know, around midnight or something like that last night. Do you want to uh, <laughs> summarize, hopefully sure. summarize? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I can. Um, I think um, my uh, <laughs> questions, and, and I think these are questions for discussion, um, is in the way that the document is um, uh, written so far um, that um, all of the supervisory of, uh, this has to do mostly with uh, social media sites. Um, and if the town uh, chooses to um, do um, social media sites, um, at the moment it states that um, all, uh, this is for the town um, uh, administrative functions and as well as the committees in the town, um, um, all uh, would be under the con uh, supervision of the town manager. And I think given my understanding of how um, we have operated, the uh, committees themselves are appointed by the um, select board and essentially operate independently and not under the town manager. So I suggest there we figure out some way of being able to separate those two functions. So if a committee um, wants to have its own social media site, um, they are um, in control of that. There are a lot of good points in the uh, policy as it exists to uh, limit any um, downside for the town as to what happens on those sites in the way of review. So I think, um, I think it's a good idea to have some kind of review process. We just have to figure out what that um, structure is um, to allow that to happen. Um, and that would probably, it, it's, it's more of an issue for um, the town committees than for the um, town departments themselves. Um, there are uh, a few other, you know, minor that we don't have to go over um, issues about, again, um, town uh, volunteers um, and the process that they would go about uh, creating it. Um, there are uh, both disciplinary actions and um, uh, and uh, how to uh, approve comments, which all, is all go back to the town's personnel policy. But as the personnel policy is written right now, none of the volunteers are covered under that personnel policy. So there's somewhat of a disjunct that needs to be looked at. Um, with regard to how, how to decide what's, what comments are acceptable. Um, there are some First Amendment issues. There are standards, because um, we don't want to get into a situation where, or, or have a fairly good understanding of, of what the standards are for what an appropriate comment is. So I think those are the kinds, those are some of the things to uh, work out. Um, and uh, my recommendations were possibly, but I'm certainly not um, wedded to this idea of, of, of creating a social media committee uh, for the, that would be able to deal with that. But I understand the idea of having another committee is probably not the necessarily the best idea. So, but I think discussing what the possible options are for, um, uh, the town committees to, to be able to use these uh, platforms as a communication device for the citizens would be a uh, would be a very useful thing and just how the structure is put together is uh, certainly up for a discussion thanks to anybody on the, else on the board have something on the, this 
Yeah, I, I, I wanted to underscore uh, several of, of the points that Josh has made. That uh, on page four, three point four, persons covered, it clearly says that volunteers are not, and yet there does seems to be some inconsistency in the language of other provisions, uh, which refers to uh, applicability to volunteers. Uh, secondly, uh, I'm the last one who should be discussing social media, uh, as everybody knows. Uh, but I didn't ordinarily consider front page forum a social media. Uh, I wasn't sure about that. And uh, I think there's a general caution that we could with profit discuss, uh, which has to do with the extent to which we're relying on judgments of behaviors. Uh, and I'm not so sure there wouldn't be a benefit at some point before we finish uh, to uh, test some of the provisions that are, f are phrased in that way for the, f for the fact of, of reducing the, the, the uh, degree of, of choice uh, anyone in an authoritative position would have to judge another behavior. Uh, I think the more we can specify and prescribe uh, those conditions, the better. It's an issue that came up in tax abatement where it would be better to be as prescriptive as we can so that, that we're not leaving up to ourselves and successive boards uh, uh, our own interpretations. But that's a general comment. But uh, I, I value his, his review. I uh, look forward to the next several steps when we'll take up, uh, under Joe's uh, guidance, other sections. And, uh, and again, uh, it, it goes without saying that this is a stupendous effort uh, for which we're very grateful on the part of uh, staff as well as uh, resources that uh, Joe has arranged. So people understand this is part of the personnel policy. Our previous personnel policy, actually our current personnel policy, is probably 30 or 35 years. Yeah. You know, it's, old, it's old. So, so, so it's, it, it was a massive amount of work that Joe and staff has undertaken. and uh, So with the social media policy and when we were originally putting this together um, with staff, uh, it was actually embedded in the personnel policy and for exactly the comments that Josh made, it was kind of difficult to have it part of the personnel policy when really it um, was a little bit more broader than just for town staff. So we decided to pull it out of the personnel policy and make it a standalone policy on knowing full well that it um, impacts all boards and employees and, and, and things like that. So, you know, I get what uh, Josh is saying. At the end of the day, I think the thought is that someone kind of needs to be in charge. I certainly don't personally need to be. I'm not on any personal uh, social media sites myself, so it's not something I seek out or do. But, you know, if the town manager, uh, whoever that person may be, is not the one that's, I guess, in charge, then I, th I think it would divert back to the board. And that seems like, I don't know if the select board now or in the future would want to have that as a responsibility, but maybe so, I don't maybe know. so. All right, Jamie and so, Colleen, you have anything? <clears throat> I'm just wondering, how do we want to, first of all, this is very thoughtful, and I think Josh took a lot of time here, so we should try to walk through these. I don't know how we want to progress reviewing these comments, or is it thinking that we'll just go section by section, park the comments, and then revisit it, or? Well, because I'd really like to have a chance. Yeah, they came day. late in, yeah. The, yeah. in the evening, so we, we haven't had a ton of time, and I, there's some good points here that I think merit consideration. I'm just yeah. wondering what's the process for? Uh, this is a discussion I, today. It's yeah. Not. yeah, I think it was just my, my uh, intent was just to, I, I highlighted some of these at the last meeting, and I just, this was a, an opportunity to put them in writing. Um, and um, so I'm, I'm open to any um, possibilities or suggestions from um, the audience as well as to, to how, how to integrate some of these things. Um, um, potentially looking at them one by one and then trying to see how, um, and I'd be willing to work with Joe on on uh, massaging the existing draft as to how to address things that the select board feels should be uh, changed, um, 
So um, I don't have any particular set method of doing it. I think this is something unusual that we haven't done before, so I'm not. Uh, and Joel would be good for you and staff. Because uh, Jamie brings up a good yeah. point, you know, what's our process going to be here? Because we're attacking our, this first one, and there's plenty of other provisions we're going to be looking at too. So, I mean, do you just want to get comments from each of us and then combine all the comments and when we finish the document, because some comments will might impact other sections also, and then yeah, when we have all the comments... That's a, that's a fair the, way, and not just from the board, from the, from the public as yeah, well. Yeah, the public. Yeah, I mean, this all is those are website, online, right? They're all online. So the, why, don't, why don't you do that? The original you... personnel policies were put together. Social media wasn't a thing, so we've never... <laughs> we don't... This is the first time going through a... A social media policy um, so this is new but um, you want to give us some guidance as to what might make a, a workable next batch or section for the next meeting for us to concentrate on oh, for the policy itself you're talking about for the personal yeah, policy itself that, um, or do you want to just the next batch for the, for the whole personal policy or just for this for us to concentrate on as the, for the as next the next next section to review um, well, why, do, why don't we do this? Why doesn't everybody flow additional comments on the social media policy through mm -hmm. Joe? Joe can put one document together, pull all of Josh's comments in, and margin comments, however it works, so we have one document we can look at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and then on to yeah. the next section, whatever and you then, recommend. And then at the next meeting, do you guys just want to do sections one through six? Start with those? Yeah. Okay. Fine. So, Joe, if people, I mean, I did, both. Um, if people want to copy of my comments or others like where how would they access them and how can they get comments to you uh, well they can email comments to me right or I mean, Ann um, um, if are, they want to see yours um, I can post yours online okay. I don't mind doing I that. mean can we have it yes yeah, like a section like we have for other things that because I, I think that will be the same case with the personnel policy as well so yeah if there is a section on the um, website that we could have for um, those comments. I think that would be helpful to most people. The board would be patient. We've had two people raise their hands. I'd like to give them a chance. If you, if, please come up to the mic, please. And then Gail, had, I saw you raise your hand too. There's a mic over there it's closer too, if, if that's better. And just identify yourself, please. Sure. Amy Saar. Um, no, I just sort of Clearly, I'm not as ed educated on this subject as you all are. Um, Josh, I guess I'm asking, is there's an issue about who c controls the gate, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But is there also already a set of guidelines? And are those going to be created? I don't, I'm not, I, there, there certainly is an, there's, there is, there is, um, sort of a framework, but with regard to, uh, there is a list of, that was put together of things that were acceptable or not acceptable on the, let me, let me get that part here. Um, I think to answer your question, the answer is no. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, is there going to Thank be? Thank you. I, is there Quick going to be? No. Mm -hmm. So I think that is something that yeah. should be developed. Thank you. Okay, Gail. Yeah, I have two questions. One of them I think you've answered, and that is that the policy as it stands now is on the website and any... The draft policy. The draft policy. But okay. also the, the existing there's personnel... No there's oh, no existing social media, but the existing personnel policy is also on, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and then I have two comments. One, one of them is, as a member of a volunteer board, I've had experience in the past where there's been sort of payback for comments that we've made that were not social media comments many years ago, um, where we felt that there were consequences for um, statements that we made regarding natural resources to um, a state office. And so I'm wondering um, whether there's something that is intended to be in this policy that draws the line between censorship and um, appropriate statements. Gail, I think you bring up a great point. I think that's a, a viable discussion because I think reasonable yeah, people can differ on, an answer right on now. that. But I think that's a discussion that really is, 
is important uh, because we have had instances over the years where one board will take one position and another board takes a different position mm -hmm. and that can cause problems and it does make sense for us uh, to work together especially when one is an advisory board like your board's an advisory board to the DRB mm -hmm. it's, you know it, it can cause issues but it's a it's a reasonable area of discussion uh, so I hope yeah, that is a I discussion that, that we can have right. as a community. In the, in the draft policy does outline the type of comments um, disagreeing with someone else is not one of the reasons, but the type of comments that could be removed by the designated town official. You know, mm -hmm. so if I think it also would be it, a do, it does list out the, the type of comments that would not be allowed. Here's an example so people can understand where there could be a conflict. Uh, there's a movement to reclassify the Little Platte as a, a different uh, status wetland to a wetland one. What would happen if the, the Natural Resources Board didn't want to do that and the Select Board did, or the opposite? Or the opposite. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> that's where you have a, can have a conflict, and that's where I think we need to have a discussion what's in the best interest of the town in order to go forward in, uh, yeah. in those mm -hmm. ways. And I hope that it will be a discussion that we all have together and that there's a, you know, there's a public airing of that conversation. The second um, thing I wanted to say is a comment more than a question, and that is that, um, as we all know, social media <coughs> um, venues change almost daily. And so I think when we have some degree of specificity in the policy as to what social media are, um, are considered social media, that we need to leave room for openness mm -hmm. and change. Yeah. Right. And, and also, a policy can be amended at any time. If two years from now there's something we've never heard. Yeah, I just would be concerned, for instance, but in the case of that. But you're very tech-savvy, aren't you, though, Gail? You oh, oh yeah, <laughs> really. I, I'm on social media all the time. I, I'm a big privacy buff. <laughs> but, um, no, my concern, my concern is just that sometimes when you can amend a policy, you can amend it after a month's discussion, and new media pop up, and we've seen that, I think, in national politics mm -hmm. every day, and media change. And so I think we... We need to be clear that we have some um, flexibility in the way the policy is written so that everybody is protected, mm -hmm. the people who may Good. have written something on something I new and the people who are enforcing it. Great point. Okay. <coughs> Mr. Saar, have you spoken on this issue yet? Uh, no. just, okay, go ahead. I just wanted to say that I'm very strongly opposed to this because I think it's fraught with peril. You only have to attend one of these meetings to see the potential for it to go off the rails. And we're going to wind up with, with cat fights and we're going to, more importantly, we're going to create another department requiring employees to monitor this apparatus. Thank you. Uh, please, I, uh, Mr. Mor Moran. Yeah, I believe you know that name well. Actually, so I, have a, I have a question. I couldn't Sean remember Moran. your first name. <laughs> Sean, S-E-A-N. Um, I have a question. So this policy, does this extend to people we employ? And, and I'll tell you the question. We employ uh, a law firm. On Facebook, one of the lawyers, the male lawyers on that law firm, has a picture of him standing in front of quite an obscene phrase. I don't want to say in public. I think it's pretty descriptive. Would this apply to that? This was brought up to me by somebody else that's saying, you're from Shelburne. Isn't this lawyer, your lawyer? Look what he has on Facebook. I brought this up to, to the town manager because uh, I know the town manager is not on Facebook. And he didn't really have an answer because we were in the middle of this policy. So I'm wondering, does that apply to them since they are an employee of the town? Just a, a they're, question. They're not employees of the town. They are not. The town's law firm. No. Are not employees of the town? They're we pay them, but they're not employees they're of the town. They're a service provider. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. Just a question. Cause oh, I think it's a, I think it's a good question. Pretty obscene. I think all of these different things to be about well, volunteers contract I mean any I think the point is well spoken in the existing um, social media it's in a way of 
of being able to separate out what is town policy, what are ta what are uh, expressions of that are um, of the town formally versus what are discussions on topics, and I think that that's that's those are important distinctions to make because um, you you any governmental body um, be it you know the select board or um, the committees or uh, departments of the, of the town have to be careful that whatever is said is consistent with what town policy is. And so those are the things that we really do have to define fairly well and, and, and what access. The other issue that goes along with that is um, an open meeting law one in that you have to be, it, it's, it's, I don't think this, the state has really defined how to deal with social media in this way, but truly if you have um, a majority or quorum of uh, a committee or a body that's having a discussion on a social media site, that may be a violation of open meeting law. And so, so limited to discussion, I mean, I assume if one of you or one of the ethics board or one of the DRB board was standing in front of this obscene poster, this law would cover that mm -hmm. because you are a volunteer or employee of the town? I think that's a, it's a good question. I think that's, I think I was one of the concerns I had is, is the applicability of this. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, and just as I was thinking about it, another thing, Joe, I mean, I don't know how to, how to do this, is maybe get some idea from the town committees how many, how many, or some idea of how many social media sites can we imagine out there? I mean, that, you know, would each committee like to have their own Facebook page? Yeah, I, no, no. I, you know, I, I don't. With this, generally, we just have to use some common sense and mm -hmm. not expect to regulate every yeah. kind right. of activity yeah. under the sun, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so, yeah, I don't think a lot of big it. organizations do it, so we should be able to figure it out. Joe, do, are there other towns nearby that have their own social media policy in effect? Yes, we looked at others. VLCT. And that's yeah. how we put this together with the help of VLCT who looked at other, you know, best practices. I mean, I, I think that the policy is hardly draconian at all. I think, Josh, you hit the nail on the head. I, I mean, in my opinion, anyways, the big decision point is who do you want to be in charge of administering this at the end of the day? I mean, I think besides that, the rest of it, um, I think someone, I don't think there's anything in here that's going to um, be too difficult to follow, quite frankly. I, mean, yeah, I think that's the... the so if anybody the has any more, we just got to keep moving things along. If anyone has any more comments, please uh, shoot them over to uh, Joe. And next time around, we will be taking one through six. Uh, how do we, do we want to get back to this? How, do, how would we get back to the social media one? I mean, do we want to, do we, uh, that, uh, it's just a procedural thing, and I think it goes with so, what Jamie was saying, yeah, is do we want to finish social media before we start personnel? Uh, no, I would think that well, would be the two steps of that meeting, yeah. So we were doing sections one through six. Yeah, I'm going to do section one through six at the next meeting, and then at, then at the yeah. end of February, we'll have to kind of put it all back together and see where we're I'm at. I'm just concerned okay. that one section yeah. might impact another section. Yeah. No, I, no, I, 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 I it makes sense to yeah, yeah, coordinate. It should I'm be okay. consistent. I'm okay with that. All right. Next item is item number eight, introduction to fiscal year 2019 fire and rescue budgets. Joe and Peter, uh, <laughs> why don't we turn it over to you guys and you tell yeah. us which one you want to start with. Uh, there, there was no good reason. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, John Goodrich can decide which chief is the best chief, and we'll go with that. Oh, there you go. <laughs> there we go. That's t um, so the, the, uh, the rest of the budget we set up um, last um, six days ago with an all-day budget hearing. The only reason that um, rescue and fire are going today is because um, the all during the day, the two chiefs um, work outside of here, so it was, it was just difficult to fit them into that schedule. So... Um, we're going to talk about the fire and rescue budget in the same manner that the select board looked at all the other budget requests that came in um, six days ago. So there's no um, 
pressure or expectation that a decision at all will be made by the board. It's simply uh, factual information. I tried to tee it off a week ago, especially with the fire department, where the goal of the fire department and uh, Peter and I is to come up with a proposal, not just now, but in kind of looking into the future of how do we ensure the volunteer department continues for as long as possible. Because what the, as the department will explain today, the amount of money that Shelburne is saving simply by being volunteer and not by being a career uh, department is astronomical. And we want to be able to continue to do that for the financial reasons, but also for the cultural and heritage and pride reasons of that we have a volunteer department and uh, the fire department has uh, been working on it with, with a committee to come up with some ideas of how do we continue providing fire service to um, this community in the most cost effective way and put off the what is likely to be an inevitable um, end in hopefully 20 years as a career fire service. And so that was the type of uh, um, discussions that we were having and uh, the fire department has a, I think, are they kicking off this uh, fire? So Linda, okay, Linda Linda's gonna go rescue after rescue, all that. Rescue will go first. So after all that, knows, the rescue department is gonna go first. Uh, rescue is a self-sustaining uh, uh, department here. They were, they're able to get reimbursement from insurance companies. Uh, and we have an excellent rescue department. Linda's done gr uh, great work. Again, this is not decision item for tonight. This is just to get information for the select board so we can put it all together to try to make some overall decisions once we have all the information. So Linda, it's all okay. yours. Linda Goodrich, Chief of Shelburne Rescue. Um, there isn't a lot of change in our budget this year versus last year, the, but there is a big change, which is the addition of a new ambulance. Uh, I know most of the select board members know about this, but I'm not sure, Jamie. We have two ambulances, and we hold an ambulance for 10 years. And so we're on a cycle of every five years purchasing a new ambulance, which we keep for 10 years. So it's like a five-year cycle. Um, and the one that we're going to replace is a 2009. And so we're going to be starting the first quarter of this coming year to build a uh, design and put it out for a bid. <coughs> Normally, it takes 240 days or more to actually build the ambulance. So therefore, we're looking to take possession of a new ambulance in 2019, first half of the year. So therefore, that's why it's been in our capital budget. And now we just moved it into our regular bu budget. So that's 250000 um, which is an a increase of about 30000 or more from the previous ambulance we purchased. And it has to do with new federal re regulations that are requiring a power lift. Um, we have a, a power stretcher now, but it's not the same as a power lift. Um, a power lift, you actually pull it out from the ambulance on this rack, and it holds it. So therefore, it, it is great for um, safety of the EMTs who are putting a patient in and out. So that's something that's uh, mandated. I believe it was a July. Is that correct? Because this year, a July. So anything purchased after this year, uh, after July of this year, uh, would require that on their ambulance. So we have to build that in, and that's quite a expensive. We, we are trying to get um, a grant for part of it, and hopefully we can do that and, and save it. Um, we have one full-time person who runs 36 hours for us. Um, they normally run Monday, Wednesday, and Friday um, to keep us in service as a crew chief and do administrative work for us. Uh, we also have 10 per diems that we call upon that are AEMT certified, which is Advanced Emergency Medical Technician. Um, and they run throughout 
the month, um, maybe 12 hours or maybe a little more on each one. Um, it varies. It, we might go months and we only have four or five that have run out of the 10, um, but we do have them available to fill in when our volunteers are not available. And they usually fill in as a crew chief and then we fill the rest with volunteers. Um, right now, there isn't a call that doesn't have an advanced EMT on the service. So we get giving the best service we can with what we have. Um, I know there's been some questions of why we're not a paramedic service. Um, basically because you have to have paramedics um, and the district used to recommend that you couldn't become a paramedic uh, service unless you had a certain percentage of your call volume covered by paramedics. Um, we are looking at that um, because right now our full-time person is starting in January to a paramedic class, which is going to benefit us um, in a year or two. Um, and then we have one per diem that is already in the class, and um, we have two volunteer, we call them volunteer per diem because they're not required to run the same amount of hours as our regular members because they run somewhere else or they're, they're getting their training and, and everything somewhere else. Um, so we eventually could potentially have enough um, paramedics to actually provide that service. Um, it's, it is a cost of about a $10,000. Um, increase to, to do that, plus if you're paying a paramedic, the rate's going to go up, so your salary's going to go up and stuff like that. So right now, I mean, there is only certain items. I mean, we probably call a paramedic 5% of our calls um, because our A's now are certified to do quite a bit, which they couldn't do before. So basically, pain, pain meds um, is something a paramedic can provide. Uh, but we are looking into, um, I'll say it easy for you, the laughing gas um, as a pain control. Um, they're, they're trialing it. It's available now in the district and they're trialing it in some areas. Um, so that's another option which would help us. Um, and, you know, we can, our A's can provide cardiac epi for somebody who's had a, a cardiac issue and um, coded on us. And they could provide that until we get a paramedic intercept. We have great intercepts north of us in South Burlington um, and Shalott. But if it's a code, we can pull them in from somewhere else if we need be. So we do have a short transport time to the hospital. So right now, I think we're functioning really well with the A's we have. And um, that's about all I have. <laughs> Long term, can you tell us about your building? Long term on the building, it is uh, falling apart on the outside. OK, thanks. I'm... That's enough. <laughs> <laughs> but it is still functioning very well. <laughs> the heat is working. Um, it, you know, it's a, it's a metal building, so it's not going to collapse. It's just the stucco on the outside needs to be patched. and to have it look halfway decent, but we've, we've kept it up. I mean, we, we do our maintenance, and as Gary said, we don't uh, get any money from the town to run our budget, and, um, you know, we've been able to do our maintenance, and, you know, all, we have to buy, and I'm not sure everybody is aware of this, but we buy everything from Band-Aids to the drugs, the only thing that we do not have to buy as a service is our linen. We get linen, clean linen from the hospital, and when we bring a patient, we take clean linen back, and that's it. I mean, the rest of the stuff, right down to the Band-Aids, Rescue has to pay for. So it is a lot of, uh, lot of money, and I think with our treasurer, Wendy, she's done a great job minimizing. Over the you know, years, so people fibulous. know, we do it here in Shelburne, our rescue department, a little different than some other communities do in Vermont. We Rescue here runs completely separately, and it's worked very well. 
it has so far. But other communities, yeah. you know, wrap it in to the to the rest of the town, and so there's there's two ways of doing it. There's probably more than two, but those are the two basic right. ones. And I'm still very supportive yeah. of what we're doing we've, because we've it's done, been so we've successful. We've done a good job, and you know, I can't say we've had some issues uh, like anybody else in any other department when you have. 40 plus type A people, yeah. <laughs> but I think we handle everything very well and it runs pretty smoothly. Thank and you. I just wanted to let people know though too, our 10 per diems that we have, I mean, I, I wrote a little statistics on it. They, we had, we pulled three of them from UVM. Um, they were students at UVM. Three of them are past students at St. Mike's. Our full-time person um, is from St. Mike's to begin with. Um, we have one per diem that is a full-time fire rescue from South Burlington and on his off hours, he does some volunteering for us. Well, not volunteering because he gets paid, but. Um, and then we have three of our per diems that are currently in med school. So they uh, find the time to still run with us. And I mean, I have one that just ran 24 hours in a row. So, you know, they, it's, it's a good organization, and I think everybody does a good job. Dr. Metz had a comment. If it's and and by okay. the way, our rules say, you know, all questions have to come to us. But in this okay. situation, okay. you're comfortable answering a question. I aren't am. You? Yes. Great. yes. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, do do you have female uh, uh, EMTs on your team as well? Female? Yes, we have. Okay. <laughs> we have and you're talking ones. you're talking about getting nitrous oxide. Yes. I presume you're aware that that's an abortifacient, yes. so it can cause abortions. Yes. And uh, that's one of the reasons why a lot it's, of people don't use it anymore. There's about um, four thousand dollars to actually implement that on our service to to keep the protection that we need. Um, they are trialing it, and it's only to be used for extreme pain. Um, but. Like I said, we have good rapport with South Burlington and Shalott that a paramedic for pain meds doesn't take long. And most of the people, you can move them. They're in pain, but, but you can move them and you really don't need the paramedic. But the extreme cases is when we call for it. So yes, we Thank are you. aware. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. Anyone on the board have uh, any questions, comments, Linda? No. Other than a thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so let's uh, go to the fire department, right? Yeah, I think uh, either Lee or Jim Buell or the chief uh, has a Well, I'll just leave it up to you guys. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to kind of lead you into what we're going on here. Um, so basically our budget, uh, it's not a whole lot different. Our normal operating budget is only 4% higher than last year's, so it's, um, it's not a huge increase. We, we do what we can to keep it as low as we can. Um, obviously, different things for cost of living increases we have to plan for. Um, but the budget itself, the operating budget, is still um, well, well in range of where we usually are. Um, our biggest, I can say, expenditures this year are going to be two two programs we're trying to install to help retain and recruit volunteer firefighters. Um, the first one is kind of an in-house program where we want to allocate a certain amount of money to start doing in-house station coverage with our own members. Uh, we have certain members that are able to work either from the fire station or they don't work days or they live in town and can respond either way. Um, we're trying to start a program where we can have a staff at the station certain days of the week, so many hours of the day. Uh, it'd be all based on what our statistics are of our highest call volumes. Um, but they would be at the station, we would pay them a, a very small stipend to just stay at station, do different duties at the station as far as equipment maintenance and stuff like that. So um, it would be four people a day as your minimum crew. You have to have a driver, uh, an officer of sorts, and, and two interior people. So um, that would be our first initiative to help our numbers as far as getting our trucks on the air as fast as we can. Um, and I hate to use anybody's misfortune, but the fire on Bacon Drive last week or two weeks ago, uh, is a perfect example of how that's going to help because we happen to have two guys at the station and my deputy chief John was over here doing a fire drill. 
um, when that call came in. So we actually had a truck on scene and water on the fire in less than three and a half minutes, I think it was. Jeez, uh, six total six from the total. time of 911 call until we showed up on scene. She's and our average ahead. response time, before you say that, our average response time is seven to ten minutes to the station to the call. So, um, Wait, And that helps. I don't know if people realize this impacts everyone's home insurance. Too. Absolutely. I, mean, I think you'll be clear about this in the presentation, Chief, um, but the fact that you were there in three minutes in the middle of the day, in the middle of the week, yep. was almost just pure luck it in a lot of ways. And that's luck. one of the Absolutely things that you're, we're trying to address in, in this budget. And, and those, those are luck. the things that having people at the station, um, if you can reduce the time of getting to the station, you know, it's, it is. It takes six or seven minutes to get a full crew in a truck at the station to respond to a call. It's just the nature of the beast of the volunteer department. Chief, we had a major expenditure with the Quint. Can you tell us uh, if you've been able to use it and its you know, success rate? or the Quint, is, <coughs> the Quint is in the station. It is actually almost, we're probably a couple to three weeks away from getting it in service. Um, we had it here when it was took delivery in October, August. August. Um, they allowed us to keep it for two to three weeks. Um, we knew there was things that had to be fixed on it, just minor cosmetic and little stuff. <coughs> um, Functionally, the truck is great, um, so they let us train with it for those three weeks, getting drivers trained, learning how to set up the aerial, um, and then they took it back and fixed all the issues with it, and we got it back uh, a week and a half ago or two weeks ago. Um, so now it is in the station. Um, we're going to start getting ready to equip the truck, get all the equipment on the truck, um, do a little bit more training on it with some people as far as driving and, and placement, and then hopefully uh, early January it'll be an in-service vehicle. And, Engine two will be the old engine two will be down the road. So. I mean, another question for you, uh, Chief. You know, Joe was talking about how, you know, we have an all volunteer department, and you know, one day we're going to have to go to a paid department. But isn't there really also a, a possibility of a stepping stone like Charlotte went from completely volunteer to I think they have one full time on, paid yeah. person who became their chief, and their we, chief became assistant. Yes, and what I've done is I've I actually formed a staffing committee um, and their goal was to research this process and they've been doing it for a better part of a year now. Uh, we've taken most of our statistics and our information from Wilson because Wilson's a perfect example. They were an all-volunteer department for a long, long time. Um, they began the same way. They started with uh, four full-time keeping the volunteers and they've progressed to, I think they're probably almost half and half now or even more. Um, then they also have a um, paid on call staff, so they still have the volunteers that can come in and staff the station if, if all the paid guys are out on the call. So we're, we're putting our numbers together based on their experiences and how they've operated. Um, but like I said, that's down the road. I mean, we're doing everything we can to obviously avoid that. Yeah, so people issue. understand the impact on the budget. Uh, currently, the fire department budget is the expenditures of about $425,000. Uh, like well, the, the the normal expenditure budget this year is one eighty five. The our budget submitted is up to four hundred thousand okay. because of the other two programs we wanted. So to we're submit. we're at a couple hundred thousand dollars. Of, in comparison, our police department, which is obviously a paid department, is a couple million dollars. So if we ever went to a full time, a paid fire department, <laughs> we're looking at a sizable cost, which is why Joe mentioned and the chief recognizes, and I think almost everyone recognizes the further we can push that out uh, as long as we can staff you know an essential department uh, the better it is absolutely and uh, Lee and Jim will be up here in a minute to discuss the VFIS program that Joe was uh, talking to that we've discussed um, but as far as my portion of this um, we're still 34 members strong we're still all volunteer um, we're still a couple 24 years ago, 7 we had an 365 issue, What's that? A couple of years ago in the department, you mentioned that, or your predecessor, I can't remember who, mentioned that the distribution of ages within the department, we, we were really a, an older department. We, we brought that number down quite a bit. Um, yeah, I'd say our average, when I started as chief six years ago, was probably late 40s, <laughs> close to late 40s. Uh, now we have, that's down into the 30s. I'm quite positive. It's, we have a ton of new members. Um, a lot of young, uh, late 20s, early 30s, people who have uh, taken to the fire service, they've been through all their training. Um, we've really had a good boost in the last couple of years. Um, like I say, we're, you know, we are still all volunteer. We still provide protection 24-7, 365. So it's, 
there are times when we do have issues getting a truck out the road quickly, but um, we're doing everything we can to change that and, and progress forward. Um, Any, well, I won't ask you about the library project because this is budget, but <laughs> I, I sure would be interested, I think most people would be interested about, you know, the library, and I don't want to go into it now, right. but, but, you know, it's your egress, you know, in, in and out right there, so be interesting you know to get we've actually yeah. we're actually meeting with them again tomorrow that's, um, on, that's on tomorrow that's on tomorrow okay good uh, we go. actually no we've um they've we've been very cooperative with the library and they've been very cooperative with us sitting down going over different plans um we've given them ideas that we would like to see um some of the plans they presented to us they didn't realize some of the kinks they would throw into our process so it's worked out very well um it's it's a back and forth communication so it is for years we've well. had problems with parking for the library uh -huh. because we didn't have enough parking spots and so uh, residents would end up parking right in the middle of the parking lot, which is right where the fire trucks have to. Come that's out. the reason you see the striping come out so far yeah. now because it's it used to be still parking in front. So that's just so people right. understand. Now I just park it to the striping. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right, I will ahead. actually turn this over to uh, Lee and Jim. They'll explain the VFIS program that we want okay. to as well. Thanks. Hi, Lee. Hi there, I'm Lee Krohn, with, uh, proud to serve with your volunteer fire department. Mm -hmm. With me, of course, Chief Ahmed, Assistant Chief John Goodrich, and Senior Firefighter Jim Buell. And just like to give you a quick snapshot of who we are, what we do, uh, why we do it is because we care. Uh, Chief, could you turn off one of those lights? That would be great. And oh, maybe it's already go off. To there you go, there. that's good, thank you. So. We are your volunteer fire department. This is a photo from last year's uh, 75th anniversary. We've been around that long and hope to be around for that long to come. Uh, as Chief said, we offer these vital services 24-7, 365, and as you probably know, it's much more than just fires. We get called out to an incredible array of incidents, car accidents, hazardous materials incidents, you name it, uh, the fire department in Vermont are seen as the cavalry to come solve the problem. Uh, it does take a lot of work, a lot of training, a lot of effort. Many of us are firefighter one or two certified and that's roughly 200 hours or more of training plus the annual training to remain certified in that and we are here to serve you every day. Uh, quick snapshot, we spend over a thousand hours a year collectively responding to calls. Many of those are carbon monoxide alarms or fire alarm activations but you have to go. You can't not go. We spend over 6,000 hours a year training. And that's just the training. That doesn't count additional community services that we provide, folks who train additionally to learn how to drive the large vehicles, which are not easy to do. We put on fire prevention and safety programs. We put on 13 programs last year in the schools and preschools and for uh, preschool providers as well, reaching over 1,000 children and over 100 adults. We also participate each year in mock crashes at the high schools and mock trials, again, trying to reach out and, and educate and prevent incidents so I that we don't to have to respond. That's an incredibly effective it's, program. It's very powerful, very powerful. We also have a marine unit responding to calls, rescue recovery operations on Lake Champlain, and the volunteers who step up for the marine training, that's yet another aspect of training that goes on. Those folks meet on Tuesday nights in addition to our regular Thursday night trainings. So as you might imagine, anything we can do to keep experienced volunteers makes a huge difference. <laughs> Starting fresh is hard to do, and it needs training, it needs equipment. I've been in the fire service for over 10 years now, and I consider myself a rookie. There's a lot to learn, and there's a lot to learn from the more experienced members. So our goal, as has been stated, number one, try to retain ourselves as a volunteer service, but number two, also retain those experienced members so we're not constantly cycling through. We're very fortunate here. As the chief said, we've gotten some younger folks on board in the last year or two, and that's not common in Vermont. So we may have an operational budget total this year, a little over 400,000, but the reality is whether it's volunteer or career paid firefighters, many of those costs remain. You need the trucks, you need the station, you need the turnout gear, no matter 
who's involved. So here's the practical financial reality. In fiscal year 17, the stipend line that we receive for responding to calls and trainings is $47,000. Um, as the treasurer, I work with John Goodrich to run the numbers. Uh, the first quarter of the fiscal year, I think that came out to $2.76 per hour. <laughs> last, last quarter, it was up in the 3 or $4 range. So we're not in it for the money. We don't expect to be paid, but there are gas and expenses that the volunteers incur. But $47,000 is the real cost to have a volunteer service. If we were all paid career service, that would be $1.6 million, rough numbers. So every year, the reality is we save the taxpayers of Shelburne over a million and a half dollars every year in salaries, benefits, expenses. So Chief mentioned the staffing approach we're hoping to do where we could have a couple days a week, a crew who's agreeing to be here and staff the station, get the rigs on the road rapidly. The other piece of it that many fire departments across the country have an, implemented is a small retirement sort of program that's keyed to length of service in this department, not whatever may have come along, and just trying to provide some additional benefit to folks when they reach the end of their service. Um, other departments have done this. It's not only helped retain experienced members longer, but in some cases help bring back experienced members who may have stepped aside for a while, needed a break, had family issues, whatever it may be. And that kind of experience is absolutely invaluable. So those are the two things that we are trying and hoping to implement in the year to come. They don't come without a price, but as you can see, we're saving the town over a million and a half dollars every year as it is. So whatever that is, we feel it's Maybe a chunk of change in a difficult year, but it's a small price to pay to help keep us all going. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Thanks, Lee. <laughs> Lee also takes incredible pictures that he shares with the town that we use on our website. All right, and uh, social media. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, any comments from the board? Not questions? I, Lee, um, is, is there is there a, man, a required retirement age? I mean, when you say retirement, what what does that mean in terms of your members or their ages or how does that work? Chief, Jim, uh, Jim Buell, past assistant chief, senior firefighter. Right now, we're not we don't have a mandatory retirement age. We're looking at mainly as people approach age 70, that they usually stop doing what they're doing. <laughs> um, so Dave will speak to that. I, I'll, refer, I'll defer to him. Fair comment, Dave. <laughs> what you find in a fire service is as people age in a fire service, they change what they do. Uh, the younger members are definitely the interior firefighters. Um, I'm 59. I still wear an air pack. I still go in and fight fires. Um, but, as, but it becomes more difficult you know, as we age. So as we do that, we, we tend to change what we do and become more of an exterior firefighter. Dave has become really instrumental as a pump operator driver in training our future pump operators. So that plays into it a lot. What this VFIS program looks at is they look at, and basically all our departments across the country that have instituted these types of programs are using an age of 62 to start as like a payout time mm -hmm. frame. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean a person would start doing that right away. It depends on themselves, their individual requirements, what they're going to be doing, what their family's doing. Are they relocating? Are they truly retiring? You know, depending what it is. But that would be where the number, of, as far as an age number, would start. Thanks. Jim, can you let us know if, if others and if others, how many in Vermont, how many other towns have instituted a retirement currently in Vermont program for, for volunteer departments? Currently, currently in Vermont, we found there's one other town that has instituted this program. Which one is that? Do you know? It gets to Keith, told, Keith told us, and I, it slips Arlington? my mind right now. Arlington? Okay. We, uh, we so can it's talk. Breaking new ground. We can, we can talk to the VFIS gentleman. He gave us the name of that town when he was up a couple weeks ago, and I forgot who it was. Um, but it, there is one in Shelburne's already, I mean, in Vermont that's already doing this. 
This is a program, as Lee Hinn Institute it alluded to before, it's, it's done throughout the whole country. Um, I'll speak, I'll speak personally. What the line item would be? I mean, this is budget talk, yeah. so. I'll speak personally know. from my own service in the department where I was chief of in New York, which is a combination career department and a career volunteer department. We instituted this VFIS rec recruitment retirement program, and we brought back quite a few members uh, who were already trained and they decided to come back and join the fire department, put in their time, get their points, and it just saved us a ton of money and a ton of time because they were already trained, and it just was a huge benefit to that department at the time. So I just want to jump in here and, and let the fire, fire uh, department off the hook because it was uh, my recommendation <laughs> that we don't talk about the um, dollar amount tonight. I wanted them to talk. Okay. Uh, that might give you an idea of that It'd be an investment, and I think the fire department understands that, you know, when Peter and I reviewed this plan with them two weeks ago, I think they probably saw the look on the faces of me and Peter and saying, well, that's interesting, but we're going to have to think about how we're going to do this. So I think that, you know, I wanted them to get the, the point across of what the idea and the concept was tonight before looking at dollar figures, because as soon as you put a dollar figure up there, then people start stop thinking about um, the program, I think. So that was my request, uh, so I'll let them off the hook on that. Um, and we're also working with the um, financial advisor of how to reduce the cost or, or, or step into the program in a way that is reasonable. And uh, the department was very, I'm speaking for them, but I thought they were open to um, looking at um, kind of creative ways or ways to step into this over a few years so that it's, at, least it's, at least it's not a financial crush. I mean, there might still be a decision for the board to make of whether or not this makes sense, but we'd like to take the uh, shock, this, the, the sticker shock, as not being part of that equation. So we're still working on that, and you know, you'll get a budget in a week or so or two weeks with something worked in there to, to talk about. Well, you told us who goes inside and who stays outside. Who gets to drive the quint? <laughs> <laughs> Figured. <laughs> We're being trained on that. So, I just, and as Joe had alluded to before, um, one of the things that we were charged with, uh, and this, is, this goes back probably even two years ago, was trying to come up with ways to extend the life of the Shelburne Volunteer Fire Department and try to make it so the town of Shelburne, you know, eventually we know down the road, career staff will probably have to come in, but if we can keep pushing that can down the road even further, and as Lee showed, it was a $1.5 million savings. So that's what we're trying to work on and right. trying to present to the board tonight. Well, thank you for your, to everyone in your department for your service. And uh, let's face it, you guys are a big part of the town. Uh, Chris Boyd has something to say, though. Just a quick point. So Chris Boyd, Thomas Road. Um, I applaud you guys not only for trying to find a way to, re to retain recruitment, because that's so very hard but also to cut down the response time. So for the general public, just a, a quick footnote, one thing that's uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technologies a couple of years ago did a study because the old rule of thumb used to be fire would double its size every minute. So if you look at a trash can, which we don't have one right here, well, right here, if you had a fire in that trash can in two minutes, the old rule of thumb would be, it'd be twice the size of that trash can. What they looked at was modern finishes and how that affected fire development. So after they got done with their studies, what they found out was fire now actually not only grows faster, it grows seven times its size every minute, but it also burns hotter and flashover temperatures within a building get much hotter. They used to be 12 to 1500 degrees, now they get up to 2000 degrees. Thanks, Chris. I don't mean to rush you, but we're I, behind I understand. We're on budget but, tonight. And I understand. But what I'm, I'm just trying to give a little clarity Thanks. that for these guys, that not only saving the time to respond can save their lives, but can affect saving public lives. Oh, yeah. It's great work. All right. Does anybody else have any questions? Oh, ch Chief. <laughs> Are you saying he's old? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, retread it. All right. Uh, are we good, Joe, on fire? Everybody good on the board? Now you've heard yeah. all the, the whole budget. Thank you for coming in fire and rescue. All right. We're at item number nine. Consider adopting a policy for property tax.
penalty waivers. This is uh, something uh, that's uh, included in our town charter, and I thank again Tom Tompkins for making that clear to everyone on the board. Thank you again, Tom. And uh, for years, the select board, I mean, going way back, way before I, the nine years I've been on the board, there's been an unwritten policy for when do you waive a penalty? When do you not waive a penalty? And so we've decided that it would be a good idea to try to put it in writing so we could have a little more clarity. And so some of us have looked at different things. Some of us have spoken with some of the other members. And uh, we're trying to come to some idea. For years, it's always been if you had death, uh, the owner of the property died, or a member of the immediate family died, or if there was active military deployment, uh, and there could be uh, so, some other reasons also. So, uh, <coughs> Joe, why don't I turn it over to you? I know we have received a couple of things. I sent you something. I know uh, Josh well, sent the you something last, that the I understand. The last version I saw others. was one that Josh put together, so I don't know of any other. Um, I figured, do, did you have that, Josh? Or? I sent it to you. Okay, I didn't, I didn't realize I was supposed to print that. I can go do that now. Um. Well, look, there's some, there's some things. If, let's just talk, rather than details, let's just talk about the general format of it. Uh, I think it makes sense to include what would be included in a, uh, a waiver policy. But for clarity purposes, do you also want to do what, like, the city of San Francisco does, which they provide clarification for what is not included in waiver. Uh, so it's, it's something to think about. I don't know how many of the people on the board have spent time looking at what other communities have done. Uh, I would assume based on, I, th I think you two worked on it together, and maybe Colleen worked with them. Uh, you guys probably looked at some other communities. I know I looked at some communities, and I, it was interesting to see what they had to offer because there are different uh, approaches, but there's, there's many similarities also. So what do you guys think? Do you, should we include what's a waiver and what's not a waiver? Do you just want to include what's a waiver? Or what do you want to do? Well, I, I think, think it's, go ahead. No, just, I think that's, I didn't consider uh, adding something that was not a waiver. Um, and I think that's uh, a good idea to look at. And, uh, and I think that's valuable. My point was I, I wanted this to be a policy that was clear enough in most circumstances um, that staff could look at the policy, follow the policy, and be able to make those adjustments without it having to come before the select board every single time. Because if it, you know, and if it doesn't fall within those, uh, the parameters that we've set forth, then the option still exists for them to come before the select board. But it seems that in the, you know, three and a half years I've been on the board, most of them have been very, very similar and uh, could easily be written into a policy. Instead of it coming before the board and there's two you know schools of thought either it's a death or you know military discharge or or um, military assignment or it's not and that's the decision and maybe that's what the policy is but if that's the policy then it doesn't need to come before the board for us to say it out loud and mm -hmm. it's in the policy um so it just seemed like this comes up every time and every time there's this big discussion and um and it seems like if we're going to have a big discussion about it, let's just have it now and put it into a policy and save us a little mm -hmm. bit of time to be able to deal with uh, other issues before us. Yeah, I, I, I would favor, as first of all, as prescriptive a statement as we can make, recognizing that there are going to be conditions and situations that are totally unexpected and without definition and can't be anticipated. So you have to have some some uh, mm -hmm. some flexibility for the situation that comes along that's brand new. Uh, secondly, I felt that they should be, uh, conditions and situations should be documented uh, in a way, in a consistent way, in a uniform way, 
which contributes to the to the fact that they're uh, they're uh, the, the whole is consistent. And uh, third, I felt we should provide for uh, uh, again as specific a case as we could, and minimize uh, the degree of consideration that has been the, the been the case, and that may be the case from board to board in as much as future boards could change the policy. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and lastly, I think we tried to recognize conditions that are, that are generic as well as those that may be specific to our area, uh, which include deployments and, and uh, other situations that, uh, 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 that affect us. The, uh, the last thing to say is that I favored developing it if we were able uh, on its own, recognizing that it was a part of a larger policy having to do with uh, abatements and other waivers and such, uh, that we were just discussing a small slice. But were we able to agree and put it in place even on a temporary basis, we could then address several recent situations which might at that point seem to qualify more so than we found. So people know we are bound by the statute, which in this case is the town charter. And the town charter says that the select board may waive the penalty, not the interest, the penalty for a late payment if made within seven days. And the phrase is for just cause shown. So to me, there's the just cause aspect of it, which is not defined, and, and that's what we're uh, speaking to, what constitutes just cause. But it also, and I agree with Jerry because he mentioned this, uh, the shown part in that phrase is, to me, the evidentiary standard. In other words, someone comes in and they, they just don't come in and say, you know, I didn't get the tax bill or I sent my check, uh, but, and that's it. The shown to me means there has to be some type of evidence in order to satisfy what we're required to do under the statute. I, th mm -hmm. I think that makes sense. Yeah. You? Yeah. And I'll give you some examples. I, I pulled up my notes uh, in regard to what we've done in the past and uh, what we haven't. In the past, it's that waivers have been appropriate for the death of the taxpayer or his or her immediate family military deployment, sudden very serious illness, where it is reasonable that someone missed a payment, town mistake, postal department mishandling, fire or other casualty. In addition, we often look at the taxpayer's history. Is there a history of late payments or is this the first time it's ever happened? And that's, I, I think, a, a good starting point and then we could add these other things. But for clarity, if we include what San Francisco and other communities do, they don't only list what constitutes just cause, they say these things are not just cause, and San Francisco includes did not receive a notice or bill, forgot to file or pay, not knowing personal identification num number or location identification number, first uh, late payment, responsible person no longer with the company, payment arrived after delinquent date with no postmark, confused by bill, unsure of what to pay, can't afford tax payment. Those things are not acceptable under the regulations that this other community uh, addressed. And then we also have the issue, this doesn't only impact individuals. It impacts uh, business entities, corporations, L LLCs, partnerships, because they own buildings also. So what are we going to do when the responsible person at a business dies or leaves or has a sudden illness? Should we expect a different standard for a business? Should they have someone else? to step in, and I think these are legitimate areas to discuss, and if we're going to have a complete policy, I think we need to consider these things. So what no, I that, And that's a good point, whether we address the principal or we address ownership. Uh, another thing to say is that, that I think a goal of this should be clarity for the applicant. Mm -hmm. In other words, someone who's applying for the relief ought to have the benefit of knowing in advance whether their application is, is viable or not, so that uh, their time is better used and, and they're more aware of what to expect uh, versus the current uh, situation. So, 
Yeah, I think I, 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 that was exactly the point I was going to make. I mean, I think that would make it easier on Peter and, and Joe if, if such a policy, we had good definitions. And so people could look at the website and or or, or call and and a, and a a a a statement could be sent out so they actually know what that is um, before they waste their time or waste our time. Um, and I suspect I don't know how often it happens, but I suspect that's what you do, Peter. Somebody calls, and then you have to go through a whole process of telling them what to do. And it would be a heck of a lot easier to have a, a well-defined policy that you can say, well, here's here's what it is. Yeah, I mean, 95 percent are just handled by me and Peter. People call up, they say, hey, I'd like to grieve this, and we usually will tell them, eh, that's probably not going to pass the test, and they decide not to not to do it. For years, when these but. matters have come before the select board, and it's the select board who has the statutory authority to waive the penalty, uh, I I would estimate. My nine years on the board, 90% of them are turned down. Maybe even higher. You know, it's 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 a tough thing. You know, so we have some we have some documents or some comments that were provided to Joe. You guys sent one in. I sent one in. I don't think we're ready to come up with a policy right now on on the spot. No, I, I think it, I, I think we need to. Look I think at it. we made a super effort over the over the weekend with everybody, but uh, uh, which itself is very rewarding, and so is this discussion. I think the interesting point Colleen introduces is whether there would be, uh, as a desired outcome, roughly uh, put a number on it, like ninety percent of the applications could be decided uh, in a matter of fact way, and maybe even reach a consent agenda. I mean, that maybe is the good test of what, and I think we're a long way from a point where we were kind of uh, f flying blind on case by case and, and risking being inconsistent. So uh, while we were hopeful maybe we could get to a point of decision tonight, I, I, I'm perfectly happy with continuing as we are yeah. and uh, f uh, fashioning a product that we can uh, perhaps approve next meeting. We do, I, I believe we do have a policy, going back to when Ken and others were on the board many years yeah. ago, it's just an unwritten policy. Yeah. And we're trying to just clarify it, make it clear for, for everyone. Uh, yeah. Well, and the only other thing that I don't think was ever either written or unwritten was, you know, it's, it's waived once, and uh, with the understanding that they'll sign up for automatic um, withdrawal. And mm -hmm. uh, and that would be part of the condition. Mm -hmm. That's it, by the way, for anyone who's not on that, that's a great program. <laughs> it's yeah. really no, easy. I think, I, I think that was enough. <laughs> <laughs> Susan, you have a comment? If you um, could just take the microphone. <coughs> Susan Clellan, Falls Road. Do you take credit card payments for property taxes mm -hmm. or just out of um, different accounts? All right, Mr. Moran. Do you remember the first name? Sean. There you go. Hey. So, um, Sean Moran. So, I actually talked to Colleen about this, and we, we were un, kind of under a like-minded. Um, I, I think when the policy is drafted, there has to be some kind of wiggle room, for lack of a better. We, yeah. we talked about uh, spouse dying. Well, I take care of a ninety one and a nine-year-old parent, what if, and I see Peter all the time, I come and give him my check, get some candy, and go away. It's because I want to make sure it gets there. I don't trust the post office. Um, you know, if, if we put, oh, spouse dying or child dying, I, I think, you know, there has to be some common sense in there. What if you have a caretaker of two parents? Or what, if, you know, to say, for example, the two that, that are up now, I can remember them very clearly. One just said, I was late, and, and I don't, Cause, and you yourself commented, well, there's no explanation. Why were they late? Did somebody die? Did somebody deferred? And then the other one that came up later, there was a whole explanation. And so they were really two different you know, things where one definitely would and one would take more consideration. So I think when drafting this, there has to be some common sense and some kind of heart in there, not just head, to, to have some kind of a, a compassion wiggle room. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thanks. You know, also, uh, when we talk about good cause shown, we have the written 
demonstration, and perhaps that could be sufficient. Mm -hmm. But yeah. in many cases, a written def uh, submission will not be sufficient, and coming to the meeting to answer questions mm -hmm. might be the determinative factor. Otherwise, you haven't satisfied the standard of showing uh, that you've met. We the had that policy. case where the where the check was. Uh, remember where the check had gone through the the system twice and came back and then went back again and I think Peter was very sympathetic uh, but on paper that didn't communicate anywhere near as much as it did having the explanation from the person that night and it certainly persuaded us. Okay, from so, a procedural standpoint yeah. Joe is obviously uh, pretty busy with the budget right yeah. now so I think it's going to yeah. be difficult to ask him to take the comments that we have and try to uh, fashion a uh, policy right now. Well, we can do that. One of us could do that, I'm sure. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I'm, I'm, I, I, I've tried to put together what Joe put together and what you, I, I haven't yeah. seen your comments, so I'd be happy to Okay, Joe, you want to just uh, that pass on my comments? Or? I can pass them on to, to Josh. Yeah. All right, so why don't you take a shot at it, and uh, if you could send it back to uh, Joe so he can distribute it. Sure. And we can uh, we'll have a take a look at it in advance. And, uh, sure. Yeah, I think we'll most try of the, to something. most of the items you you mentioned were in what we had put together. As I well. took a look at what you sent, and uh, uh, that's why I brought up, you know, the idea of what some municipalities have done in, mm -hmm. of including what's not good cause, for clarity purposes. And I noticed you didn't include that, which is fine. A lot of places mm -hmm. don't, and. Uh, I think it might be enough to establish what is, <laughs> what does qualify, than maybe trying to figure out what doesn't. I mean, uh, by the yeah. way, most of these policies are very yeah. short. Yeah. They, these are one or two pages. That's it. It sounds a, it sounds a little bit like those items you see in the USA Today about excuses given in traffic court. You know. <laughs> All right. I think are we set on this item for everyone? Okay. <laughs> All right, so our next item is consider uh, item 10. Consider two property tax waiver requests, one for 39 Heather Lane and one for 263 Frogs End. So, Joe, do we have the people here by any chance? No, the select <coughs> board asked to review That's these some, two. Right, a couple of people on the board wanted to revisit these. <coughs> these I believe we voted uh, no on the waiver request. And the other one, the Frog's End one, I mm -hmm. think we uh, continued it for today. Correct. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. And I was hoping that we, have, you know, have a discussion. If we came up with a policy, it would be do it. You know, I'm not. I mean, does it? You know, is there? A, is there a? Um, how fast do we need to act on these requests, so to speak? Well. Per charter, it's come and gone, but I think you can continue it as a, instead of a waiver, a reimbursement. Oh, does, does the tr charter say, uh, I th this is off the top of my head, but I think it says the seven days is not that we make a decision within seven days, it's that the payment is late, but it's still made within seven days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? So let me ask you that. Do you know if in those in these two instances whether payment was with, made. whether payment was made within seven days? And do you, well, do you know, Peter? Well, I think historically speaking, and Peter can correct me, and this probably goes back uh, a lot longer. This has been part of the charter that the board, for a long time, uh, probably has not followed um, to the T. And some of it is strictly. Um, Pragmatically, if we get someone who contacts me and Peter um, two weeks could go by before a select board meeting uh, comes up. Yeah, but I don't think we have to make our decision within two weeks. I think the payment has to be made within seven days of the due date. Mm -hmm. That's what So I, I don't, you know, again, this is off the top of my head, <clears throat> but I don't it's think we have to make a decision within two weeks, right? You have it? I don't know. It's a little vague when you read it. But. Oh, we got it right here. Oh, good. I mean, Peter might be able to give you a little more historical um, I think it says you, I don't think, when I read this right now, do you see a limitation when we can make up our mind? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't you see it? I don't see it. 
Um, We're looking at 147-9.2 penalty in the interest of the town charter. Except instead, instead of a waiver, it's a reimbursement. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So what do you guys want to do? We have this as a decision item. We can always uh, deny it. And if we wanted to put it back on for a reimbursement at a later date after we came up with the policy, we could always do that. I, that would be my preference for sure. Yeah. What do you think? I think we have to stick with the unwritten policy we've okay. had in place until we have a new policy. Josh and Colleen, what do you think? Well, the unwritten policy, though, is, you know, subject to interpretation. Like, that's his interpretation, is that uh, it's upon death and, um, and military assignment. You know, when the one that we looked at yesterday, or last week, was it last week? Two weeks ago. Um, which was the one last week. You know, his... It was about a gentleman whose wife is going through serious medical issues and for the very first time missed the town um, tax payment due after 22 years. And uh, and so if you go by Gary's um, interpretation, then this would be a no. But that's an unwritten policy that he's interpreted. And not everybody, you know, in the three and a half years that, we've, that I've been on the board, these have gone both ways, um, depending on who's sitting here and your interpretation of that. And Josh's and Jerry's. So, so it sounds like I we would didn't still have a collective policy. No, right. no there was no, no, well, no years, policy. I'll, I'll tell you this is what he <laughs> said. This well, is what this, we should my do. My first right. seven this years on the problem. board, no, the, the, every the board member universally voted against uh, waivers, except when there was death and military depo deployment, or it's, I, I think there might have been a sudden heart attack one time or something like that. But have we been since the last, since. That? The addition okay, of some no, no, hold on a second. Maybe everybody <laughs> voted loosened. in favor <laughs> of, the, of it being waived in those circumstances, but in other circumstances, then everybody voted to their conscience. Look, I think it's reasonable to have different opinions on this. Yeah. I, I, I think it's fine. I just I want to have it I uniform. Disagree with you on and I think that. that's what, Jan, that, okay. that's what was bothering me as each one of these is that it was sort of like, out of the ether. Yeah. Right. How do you how do you pull this out? And Plus, it's brutal to be s sitting here and to and say, say no to someone. Not. It's right. it's hard. Well, the the quick history, Jamie, was that we we contended ourselves with the idea that we really should have a policy, and then bang bang came to, mm -hmm. uh, which more than more than uh, needed to be uh, shouted. You better get a policy, <laughs> or or try to be consistent from meeting to meeting. So. I'm with Colleen on this. I think that if we if we can approve uh, a policy and then revisit these two cases yeah. with no guarantees that they'll be that the decision would be different, but at least subject them to a policy, given that they were part of the immediate discussion here, uh, and simply draw the line at those two and not not try to go back through history. So if we're going to yeah. revisit these, sounds reasonable, yeah. which I'm fine with. Yeah. Uh, do you want to? <clears throat> vote to deny the waiver now with the understanding of re reimbursing them, f reimbursement consideration later, or just continue it? I would just continue it. Yeah, yeah I would just continue it. Okay. Or, or because we don't have an active po acting policy, we could address this in the way that we would normally address it and vote on them and then go forward. Yeah, but then, uh, whatever you guys want to do, I'm good. But then, and Peter can probably weigh in, I bet if we decide to wave and then and then we decide not to, you know then we decide that it shouldn't have been waived then we have to go back to them and say no you have to give us back money oh, I, don't think it'll be, I, I wouldn't vote for the policy to become retroactive mm -hmm. so that's why i'm with jerry i think we just kick the can Defer. down the road All right. I, I would entertain a motion to uh, continue these two matters <laughs> until a date at the until the next meeting after a policy has been adopted by this board or as soon as practical thereafter. So moved. Moved by Colleen. Second, Second by Josh. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 And in the meantime, Josh, I will take my notes and email them to you, and you can yeah, you know, I do mean, whatever uh, you want with it. Well, Joe we'll gave me a... a a template, and I tried to put the template, put the items that uh, Jerry and Colleen and I put together. Great. And so All I right. can just add add those to it. All right. Next item is uh, item eleven. Consider approving the town's participation in the Census Bureau's local update of census addresses program. Uh, 
right. Joe, why don't you uh, tell us about how the sure, census this is uh, everything the, about on the recommendation of your planning and zoning director, uh, Dean Pierce. This is the kickoff to 2020 census, and um, this will be the start of Shelburne's participation. The advantage that we have is that Pam Brangen, who is a planner with the Regional Planning Commission, has agreed to be our designated Luca liaison. Um, she's forever. doing that forever. So I put a motion uh, in front of you that Dean and I wrote up today. Uh, Jamie has it, so I recommend, I recommend Jamie read passing it the motion. Jamie, why don't you read the motion and then we can have a discussion. I move that the town of Shelburne register for the U.S. Census Bureau's 2020 LUCA program and further authorize the following designations. One, Gary Monstange, select hey. board chair, <coughs> is authorized to sign the town's response to the LUCA invitation. Two, Pam Bragnan of the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission is designated as the town's LUCA liaison. And three, Dean Pierce of the Planning and Zoning Office is designated as a LUCA reviewer. Okay, moved by Jamie. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Colleen. Any discussion? And basically, so, this program is just trying to help get the most accurate uh, information possible in Shelburne to help with the 2020 census. Okay, I'm good. You guys good? You right? No, are you Anyone have the alternatives? <laughs> What'd you say? <laughs> I'm good with whatever the motion was. <laughs> All right, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, passes. Next item. Uh, we don't have to do 12. All right, everyone agree with that? Agree. Okay. Agree. 13, uh, continuation of public comments. Does anyone else have any additional public comments? Not on tonight's agenda? Nope. Okay. Now, oh, <coughs> I'm sorry. Nora Von Stange, my wife. We were on stage, Ridgefield Road, and yes, in the spirit of full disclosure, I am married to Gary Von Stange. Not just a coincidence that you have two. Sure. You can take it out. Does that work? Is that good? Yeah. Okay. That's better. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll repeat that. Nora Von Stange, Ridgefield Road. Um, I am Gary Von Stange's wife. Uh, but would like to start this off by letting you know that um, I am a voter, taxpayer, and business owner in my own right, and I'm here with my own views to share with you. Um, I did send a letter to you all, but am here to speak just because it was very late in the day. Um, and it is, in fact, to urge you to vote in support of pursuing the appeal of Judge Sessions' recent decision in Vermont Railway versus the town of Shelburne. Um, I followed the lawsuit from its beginning. I have read the pleadings and the motion papers and the decisions. Um, I also have a background as a litigation attorney and for the last just about 25 years and had the extreme good fortune and honor to serve for three of those years as a clerk in the district, federal district court and the second circuit court of appeals. And I, this is not an introduction to a detailed legal analysis, I assure you. Uh, but to let you know that as a result of all of that experience, I have complete confidence in an appellate review procedure process that offers the opportunity to have three judges take a fresh look at the factual assessment and the legal analysis of one judge. And at issue in this case, among others, is the reach of an already powerful statute to preempt to preempt the ability of, or really to displace the ability of municipalities or states or other local government entities to regulate the activities within their borders. 
in my view, this is an issue on which reasonable jurors could disagree and therefore presents a meritorious appeal. And some of my reasoning behind that is that the town is the government in entity in which individuals have the most influence. And I think that's a status that justifies efforts to preserve it. The Second Circuit has recognized and upheld limitations on federal preemption as it applies to historic police powers. An appellate review of the reach of the district court's opinion in this case is important not only to the town, but to the, define the contours of a precedent that will be applied to other mis municipalities, local governments, and states in the exercise of their respective police powers. I have heard and read the opposition voiced by people to the appeal based on financial considerations, a general sentiment that it's just time to move on, and in addition, agreement with the decision that would be subject to risk uh, for reversal or, or modification if it was appealed. But I have heard no principled or practical or consequential reason to reject the opportunity to pursue a low-cost appeal, and I believe that in the absence of such a reason, it would be irresponsible to do so. Certainly pursuing the appeal does no disservice to the railway, which will have a full and fair opportunity to be heard, and I urge you to support the continuation of the defense of the railroad's lawsuit and vote to pursue this appeal. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Saar. <clears throat> the board seems hell-bent on pressing on in the face of defeat after defeat and mounting legal bills. Um, I presume that the board felt confident in taking the, the case to appeal. And, um, well, something went wrong with that calculation. Um, you know, forecast, I, I would say, pretty clearly by the opponents of the town's actions. But here we go again. And I would argue on the basis of a moral objection. The town has, I called it a vendetta early, the, the select board has run a vendetta against Mr. Wolfson, who's a local resident, and he provides a public service in the storage and supply of salt. The fact that the town, the select board, has not bothered to inspect the site and take into account the expert opinions of someone like Mr. Boyd, who got a full tour and a full explanation and was shown the measures that they have implemented from the start and in response to concerns. And the, the metering they're doing now is, uh, sounds much better than the towns at the salt shed. So uh, I guess uh, the select board um, will vote on this. And I appeal to those of you who aren't committed to hell-bent um, uh, pursuit of an impossible goal to please use your common sense and your legal expertise to s torpedo this thing right now. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Okay, thank you. Next up is select board comments. Jerry, I don't think we've started with you in a while. Uh, Would you like to start? <laughs> Well, tis the season to wish for peace and goodwill. And it probably starts with us. And I'm pleased to say that in the last several weeks, I think there's been a great deal of progress made with everybody's help, including all of yours. And we, uh, I think, have put more than one foot in front of the other on a 
road to perhaps uh, uh, a more productive and uh, more enjoyable uh, self-government experience. Uh, the very best of the holiday seasons to all of you. Thank you, Jerry. Colleen, why don't you go second tonight? Mix it up. I will second all of Jerry's comments and uh, I hope every single the last one. Yeah, so we should all just sing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie? I'll concur. Well said, Jerry. Hard to follow. <laughs> Josh? I agree. And just there we go. Do we all find Keep it great? We wish we you a merry And Gary will sing. <laughs> <laughs> Gary will sing. Uh, I, uh, nothing. So, town manager's report. Yeah, two things real quick. I just want to um, point out to the board, uh, if you haven't, uh, if you didn't read the free press, that a number of area communities have pushed the regional dispatching ballot item forward. Burlington voted um, pretty resoundingly to move it on to vote. South Burlington has as well, um, and a few others. I'm not sure if they, Colchester has uh, moved it forward too, and some others are. So it is moving forward on some with some of the other communities to uh, a town meeting warning. Just so wanted to point that out. Uh, it was at least online okay. this morning. I don't know if it was in the print edition. Um, and then the other one, uh, last week there was an idea about a, a committee for the police, and I understand that, that was more about the interviewing for a chief, but I did, talk to our acting chief noble about you know just bringing some citizens and some residents into the mix and what could be effective uh, interaction between the public and a police department um, and the type of things that we talked about that we thought would be ideal for that would be to um, kind of um, solidify our community watch program would be something that might uh, fall under that umbrella where some citizen input would be valued of, of how to make that program. Uh, it is, we do have that program in, in some neighborhoods, but I think it could be expanded. Um, another area is to how to best work with the schools, area schools. I think that's something that we could involve. Um, and then another area that has come to my attention is working with the public uh, for education purposes, uh, particularly, but also to understand. Um, the um, issues with the uh, Vermont Sex Offender Registry and the fact that a lot of the information on that registry is a incomplete and that the number of registered sex offenders in Shelburne, for example, have uh, has increased um, fairly substantially in the last few years. And the information, even the um, the mem people who are on the registry, all that information is not complete. And also the other thing that's not complete for people is where some of the high-risk offenders actually live in town. Uh, and so I think those are some important uh, issues that citizens could become involved with the police department on. So I'm just going to work with Acting Chief Noble on an idea uh, around those ideas and, and reach out for the public to, for some help on Neighborhood Watch and, and some of these other issues. What do you mean? I'm, like, I always thought that there was um, a sex offender registry and uh, and that if somebody moved into the neighborhood that was um, a registered sex offender that they had to let their neighbors know. That's not the case. My understanding is that is not the case, but there's, um, I need to, again, work with the, the police department, the state, and I would like to work out, reach out to the public and have their input on how to best educate um, the community on these issues. There's no state guidelines on this? Well, we'll just start work on that. So. Joe, I wanted to remind you, you uh, sent an email where you might discuss another item regarding a package. Oh, yes. Uh, so I don't know, uh, the one from earlier today. So I will let the uh, people in the public know. I don't know if it was obvious when you were coming in, but the um, I don't know what the what the unit's called, state bomb unit or the state hazardous ma uh, materials uh, department uh, came in today. It was during the psych board meeting, so I don't know if people noticed that when they were coming in or not. There was a susp suspicious package uh, delivered from Germany to someone here in Shelburne who they rightfully um, kind of raised some red flags and they brought it to the police department and um, it was suspicious enough where we've had a call in um, people to come and look at it. I don't know what the results of that um, investigation is, but the state was bringing in their 
I'm assuming they're a little robot that comes in and looks at it. And so that's been going on all the while that we're here. <laughs> We haven't heard it yet. It wasn't no. the it wasn't we ticking it or anything, but uh, it was it was more of a it was a substance. So, all right. Um, thank you. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Metz. Uh, I don't understand, Mr. Chairman, um, about the selection process for the new police chief. I'm aware that uh, the temporary police chief was uh, selected uh, by a, a committee or a panel uh, who considered uh, a number of applicants. Uh, and I don't understand why the same process uh, would not be used for a permanent police chief. I don't understand that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Let me correct something or clarify something. Yep. There was a committee that was assembled uh, for the appointment of the deputy police chief, who is now the acting police chief. That was not a decision item by that group. That was a recommendation from that group to the town manager, because under statute, is that it is the town manager who makes that decision. All right, so going forward, it is, again, the town manager's decision, not the select board's decision on this. And like I said to you privately, Dr. Metz, and I said here before, um, we've just had our plate full with a lot of things, and so the ultimate decision of how that's going to play out, I just haven't had time to get to that yes, yet. Yes, going forward, I would like to suggest that at least one member of the Shel of Shelburne resident be involved. I, that's all. Yeah, that was Linda's. Linda's. Okay. I appreciate that input. All right, uh, next item is to consider entering executive session for 1 VSA 313 A1B to discuss town manager's legal <laughs> counsel's letter as related to the employment contract between the manager and the select board. This is relates to the item that uh, Joe read a letter about three weeks ago. So I was going to read, Gary, I was going to recuse myself for this unless the board had you a later recuse on. recuse yourself because you're represented by counsel. Yeah, and, exactly. And also, and if the board, but if the board wanted to bring me in for whatever reason later. You'd be available. I'd be available. But I'll assume that I'm going to recuse myself at least for the beginning because I've been represented by counsel. That's right. Okay, and uh, is anybody else represented by counsel on the board on this? No? Okay. Uh, Mr. Sarr, you have a comment on this one? Yes, I do. In fact, um, it seems to me you shouldn't be uh, dealing with this behind closed doors uh, because the attorney who recommended that you do so is in fact a town employee or town contract employee of the town and is therefore biased. And this it, it, when matters rested at the time of uh, Mr. Colangelo's letter <clears throat> being submitted, there was the following exchange at the end where someone on the board, and I believe it might have been the chair, but I can't be sure of that, said no one on the board knew uh, uh, of the chief's uh, suspension before it happened. At which point, Mr. Colangelo said quite clearly, that's not true. Now, uh, what I care about here is the reputation of the chief, which has been sullied and dishonored. This is a man who strapped on a gun every day for 30 years and more years in defense of this town and each one of us, and he's been treated in a despicable fashion. And uh, I, would, I would still like to get to the bottom of it uh, but I submit that the town owes him some kind of reparation by way of a chief, a chief day or some other recognition of his um, very honorable service. Thank you. Okay, I'm just going to uh, take objection to your comment that the town attorney is biased. Uh, okay. Uh, someone like to make a motion? Uh, Finding that uh, 
under 313A1B that premature general public knowledge would clearly place the public body or a person involved at a substantial uh, disadvantage? So moved. moved by Colleen. Second. Seconded by Jerry. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Uh, and then uh, someone would like to make a motion to enter executive session to discuss uh, the letter received from Joe Colangelo's attorney and in which he asked for a public correction of the record. Yeah, and I want to be clear that my letter from the attorney was addressed to the board, not to individuals in the board. That's correct. To the board. It was. All right, someone would like to make a, a so motion to enter executive session? Okay. Uh, moved by Colleen. Is there a second? Second. <clears throat> Seconded by Jerry. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Do you want to go over there? Jerry, would you like to make another motion? Yes. I don't have it. Just move to exit executive session. Oh, oh right. I move we conclude the executive session and uh, and and re-enter regular session. Okay. Moved by Jerry, seconded by yep. Josh. Yep. Any discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Uh, the board is uh, agreed to make a quick statement. I'm going to read it, and then ask for a motion uh, for the board to approve the statement. The board had knowledge and was involved in the decisions leading to the settlement with the police chief, and at no time did anyone on the board question Joe's conduct, professionalism, or integrity. Just a point of order. I think you had stated before that it's not a settlement but a separation agreement. Uh, yeah, but I didn't call it that. This is I said to the settlement. I got it. So I think okay. it, it, it's fine. That's fine. Okay. So to approve as as read as read. Okay. Moved by Jamie. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Jerry. Any discussion? Doctor Metz. Sorry, um, your your statement said uh, the uh, how how did you phrase it? Uh, the I said the the board approved the. I'll read it again for you, okay? It's, it's pretty Thank short. Uh, the board had knowledge of an involvement in the decisions leading to the settlement with the police chief, and at no time did anyone on the board question Joe's conduct, professionalism, or integrity. Yes, sir. Thank you. But I thought that the question raised by uh, the attorney's letter was not the settlement issue, but the suspension issue. I could be wrong about that. But uh, we're, what we're questioning, or what the question had been, was had the board knowledge of the suspension, not the settlement, but the suspension. Okay. Uh, any other c comments? Uh, and by the way, this statement, just to explain it, came from the request. It's, it's basically a verbatim restatement, re a restatement yeah. of, the, of what was requested. All right, so we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. We're done. Someone like to move to, I think we're to adjourn, right? So moved. Moved by Jerry, seconded by Colleen. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.